Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Margaret McClelland. I'm the General Manager uh, of Melbourne's North Food Group, and it's my pleasure to be here today. So thank you um, to all of our very proud partners, Choice Energy, uh, for inviting me along. Uh, now, today's seminar, um, I'd like to welcome you all, and also the, the post attendees that may watch this recording later. Welcome to you. Uh, I guess at the moment in everyone's, uh, you know, at the tip of everyone's tongue at the moment is all around energy. So it's perfect timing for what Choice are doing today. I know a lot of our food and beverage manufacturer members, um, it's certainly something that concerns them um, with, you know, the, the actual rate of, um, you know, the, the energy bills, et cetera, et cetera. So I know Choice have worked with a number of our members um, and has certainly um, seen some huge reductions, which is great. So you'll find out a bit more today uh, about that, but just a little bit about Melbourne's North Food Group. We're a not-for-profit uh, association. And uh, so we have a number of businesses, not only in the North of Melbourne, but we have them around Australia at the moment, which is great also. So we assist them with exporting group buying, um, voice to government, a whole gamut of different things. It's quite a unique little group. So please reach out if anyone does want to know any more, more than happy to, um, to help with that. But um, I would like to introduce uh, our speakers today and, uh, and, and thank you for being here. Uh, we have Alan Gill, the Executive Director of Choice Energy, Lachlan McGee, Solar and Renewable Energy Solutions, uh, we've got uh, Callum Reeve, Chief Boss. I mean, I love this, Callum, Chief Boss. I and mean, who doesn't want to be a Chief Boss of Kaiju Beer? I mean, great job you've got, Lockie. So we'll have to have some question and answer time as well. Um, so if you want to go into the chat function and uh, we'll have some Q&A at the end. So please, any questions you do have, please submit. But without further ado, thank you very much again for being here. And I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Alan Gill. Thanks, Alan. Thank you, Margaret. A uh, very kind introduction. And uh, yeah, thanks for facilitating today. Hopefully um, there can be some interesting updates and uh, a bit of advice as to uh, what the members of your association um, can do to take some matters into their own hands. So thanks for having us. So first of all, a quick insight to Australia's energy market. Um, it's been a weird couple of years in general, of course, with pandemics and the alike, uh, but the energy market has nonetheless been no less volatile. Uh, in February, we saw five-year wholesale market lows, and that's steadily increased uh, right back to pre before uh, above before previous me measures. And there's been a couple of reasons as to why that's happened. So um, the five year market lows were really due to one of the coolest summers that we've experienced in years. Uh, some of our major capital uh, cities had you know, snap lockdowns and uh, cold snap lockdowns, that is. <laughs> uh, and, but what it meant is that the lack of the use of uh, air conditioners, heating of pools, created an artificially low demand. So Australians just weren't using as much power last summer, um, which meant the wholesale per sale price uh, came down, supply and demand. Um, but then it went back up because uh, there were some generation problems that collide in Yulon power stations, which had fires and floods uh, appreciatively at the same time, uh, at a very similar time. But uh, what Choice Energy were advising their customers to do, Margaret, um, in February is to take a forward position of their next contract. So whilst the market's nice and low at wholesale, take a position, even if your next contract begins in 2023, organize that now whilst the the load is very cheap so um yeah there was there's some plenty of opportunity in the last sort of 12 months generation companies uh, need to recover their losses so prices have risen uh, but just as an example origin wrote down one billion dollar in asset value uh just at a raring power station in new south wales um, and so we're not foreseeing february 2021 prices uh retail prices, that is, uh, return to anything like they were uh, in the short term. Uh, you know, over a short period of time, AGL share price fell more than 48% and AGL 67. So those companies have got to do something, those generation retailers have got to do something to 
uh, win back uh, that market. Um, so we we do not expect prices uh, to be at a lull anytime soon. Um, what I, what we would say is don't get caught when the demand returns. Uh, so whilst there has been a softening, definitely you know, Choice Energy work with over 5,000 businesses. And so we have a very good feel for what's going on in the market. New South Wales and Victoria are up and open and vibrant and ready for business. Um, so we do expect the demand to go up uh, quite considerably over the summer. Um, and what we're ex uh, anticipating from Queensland to Tasmania is a warm and wet start to the summer season. Uh, so higher than average energy usage is going to push prices up um, as demand increases. Now here's uh, five quick tips uh, as a food and beverage business that you might want to explore to keep your energy costs low. So the first I alluded to, never wait till the end of your contract to negotiate a next one. Uh, work with a broker uh, where you can organize your next contract in advance, uh, like the Nepean River Dairy did. Um, they organized uh, their next contract two years in advance. So when the timing is right, that's when to organize your contract. And number two, uh, work with energy, an energy consultant uh, who can take your exact load profile to the retailers. So why that's so important is um, when a retailer that's going to be taking on your business doesn't know how you're going to use electricity, they have to price in a premium um, because they have to assume uh, that they're, they're going to get their matching a little bit out. But if you're able to take the uh, 365 days of consumption data, create a profile, they know exactly the type of customer they're taking on board. Um, and so work with a broker who can do this easily for you and go to a lot of the other companies uh, that, you know, we're seeing a lot of the tier twos move up towards the tier one now. Um, and so we're winning uh, business for uh, for our customers where you just might not look yourself as a customer because you wouldn't know uh, the offerings that are available. And number three, uh, your bill's validated. So uh, the energy component of your bill typically makes up 20 to 25%. Uh, there's a whole heap of uh, calculations that come in to the lion's share of the bill, which is your network distribution charges. Um, so uh, if those uh, bill inaccuracies are uh, being passed on to you, it might be without your knowledge. So make sure you work uh, with somebody that can validate your bills away from your retailer. Um, ensure that your network costs are fully optimized. So every year um, you should be getting an assessment done to see if there's any savings that can be made to the 50% of the bill that's owned by the guys that have the poles and the wires. Um, again, uh, a broker will know all about this and then finally once you've kind of optimized that bill as much as you possibly can uh, look to see what the residual cost of the grid power is um, and see if you can generate it yourself for cheaper uh, through solar i'm now going to hand over to lachlan mcgee uh, who has been in the solar uh, market and with choice energy uh, pretty near to our inception um, and so uh, Lockie's going to interview one of our customers in Callum Reeves, Chief Boss at Kaiju Beer. So Lachlan, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Alan. Thanks for the introduction. Um, what I'll be running through today is just a, a bit of a timeline to start with about the solar industry and some of the things to look out for as a food and beverage manufacturer. Um, but I think it's important to understand where the industry has started in Australia, which will give a bit of insight into potentially where it's going as well. Um, and the first point that we have here is that the cost of solar technology fell by roughly 80% in the past 10 years. So back in 2007, 2008, the cost of a home system was generally something in the region of twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars, and obviously now you know that's a much much cheaper technology around, um, and and that applies commercially as well. So it has come down in price quite a lot, but it is now at a stable point where a lot of those manufacturing uh, improvements that were made over the last decade have now normalised in terms of price. Um, the other thing which a lot of people are wary of and again is something that has plagued the industry in a way there's been over 900 solar companies which have been in existence since 2007 which are no longer operating and a big problem the big reason behind this is there's been so many different government schemes 
uh, rebates, grants, uh, et cetera. And a lot of these companies were never really set up for the longer term relationship with customers. A lot of it was about taking advantage of these government schemes while they were available. And then obviously the business model never had a chance of stacking up. So it's something that unfortunately on the right hand side, you'll see there, the biggest loser in that space, unfortunately, is the business with the solar system that no longer has any support or oversight. And that's a, a pretty common story, unfortunately. Um, and the other thing that we've heard quite consistently over the last uh, six or seven years, there is a lot of confusion out there. What sort of system do I need? What sort of technology do I need? What's the best equipment? What size do I need? What do I qualify for in terms of government funding? Uh, so something we try to make really easy is just present it all in a really streamlined, high level uh, assessment, just to, to clear up a lot of that confusion. So yeah, some considerations for solar, uh, as we just talked about, making sure that the business is gonna be around. And what we've typically found is the solar companies that have gone and done quite well and have been around for that, you know, seven, eight plus year uh, time frame are the ones that do other things than just install solar. So they might do things like power factor correction, LED lighting, they might do some consulting work, they might do some energy broking. So there's something else that they do where they're not just relying on one technology or one stream of revenue, which is pretty important. Um, uh, an old adage, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, we see this a lot with um, people saying that we can, you, you'll never get a bill again. That's one of the most common ones we hear. You put solar on, you'll never get a bill. Uh, it's just simply not true. And what tends to happen is systems get oversized and I'll get into how that's uh, not a great outcome for the end user uh, in a little bit. Um, the other thing to consider as well, it, it goes along with the second point, um, the most expensive way to install solar is cheaply. So like any industry, you've got uh, very, very cheap, uh, fast technology that's available. And then you've got premium technology that's going to last a much longer time. And there's obviously a big price difference there. Um, the main consideration with solar is it's not like a traditional appliance that you can replace and uh, buy a new one in two or three years time. Um, that system, if it's designed correctly, will be on your premises for anywhere from 20 to 30 years if it's done properly. And so it's not something that you wanna to have to replace after five years um, because obviously the costs and labor, et cetera, associated with that uh, are very, very high. Um, and then the final thing is, you know, are you guaranteed a minimum level of performance by the installer? So everyone comes with a manufacturer's warranty for the equipment, but is the installer going to give you a minimum uh, guarantee about what the system is actually going to do for you? Because without that, what we find is the business is the one taking all of the risk and the installer is taking absolutely no risk. So the propensity to take shortcuts or to do cheaper work on site is much, much higher when there's no guaranteed results. So they're just a couple of things to look out for, um, but certainly the too good to be true is something we still see today. So in terms of specifically for food and beverage manufacturing, um, what we found over time is that solar, as I mentioned, will never cover 100% of a manufacturer's usage. And the, one of the big reasons for this is due to equipment such as refrigeration or chilling units, which have to keep um, produce or, or beverages cold for a, a sustained period of time. Um, obviously the sun shines for roughly eight hours in winter and about 14 hours in summer. So a maximum of around 50% is, is what's gonna be achieved. And that's at the absolute upper end for a, a food and beverage manufacturer. If you're hearing anything else, 70, 80, 90, 100, you know it's not true. Um, big is not always better with solar. And the reason I say this is when businesses put on too much solar power onto their premises, and if they're in a position where they're not able to use all that power, it will go back onto the, the grid outside their property. And the problem with that in Australia, feed-in tariffs originally when it was first introduced were around about 70 cents a kilowatt hour. And now in some states, they're 5.2 cents a kilowatt hour. So the rate of return that you make for sending power back to the grid is, or has gone down by roughly 90% or even more than that. Um, and the other issue there is that the money you make from sending power back into the grid is generally one fourth of the price of the power that you've got to buy first thing in the morning when your solar system's not producing what you need. So you do lose out a fair bit if your system is too big. 
Um, but the other thing to be wary of, and, and something that we've started doing a lot at Choice Energy, is providing some real-time carbon offset and green credential tracking via solar. So we can actually set up technology where it actively tracks the amount of carbon being offset, um, the amount of cars being taken off the road, and a, and a number of various other metrics, which might be very useful um, uh, to an individual business who's trying to promote their green footprint or trying to show the market that they're, they're becoming a sustainable operation. So definitely something to look at in terms of supply chain and, and market demand there. And uh, yeah, I'd like to introduce uh, the chief boss again, uh, Callum. Again, I love that title as well. I'll be angling with Alan to get something similar against my name, but uh, um, Callum, I'd just like to ask you a couple of, couple of questions just about your experience um, with solar, and I guess just to start with, I mean, what, what in particular sparked your interest as a business owner in wanting to install solar power at your factory? Uh, when we started uh, the brewery, we, we were very well aware of how carbon intensive it can be to make beer. Um, and we, you know, we have some social conscience ourselves, um, my brother Nat, who started the business and I, um, and we wanted to know what we could do to improve the situation. And obviously solar was the big ticket item to reduce that carbon footprint. Um, and it also, it was, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a great advantage that it makes a financial sense as well. Um, you know, the, the payback period was, uh, was very obvious um, in, in, the, uh, in the installation. We've definitely seen that in our, in our, reflected in our bills um, being a lot lower, certainly not 100%, um, you know, uh, as you grow, the, there, is, there just isn't enough roof space. <laughs> <laughs> to, yep. put, to put solar panels on to, to certainly to cover um, to cover what it takes to make beer. Basically, you're making water very, very hot and very, very cold one after the other. So, uh, you know, that, that's that's a very difficult, um, very difficult thing to, to completely decarbonize and, um, with current infrastructure. But um, but yeah, that, they were kind of the, the, the main things, um, you know, that sustainability aspect um, being the, being foremost for us. Yeah, look, absolutely. And can you just describe, I guess, did you have any initial hesitations um, around the solar industry or the technology as you went on this journey or started this journey? Um, technology wise, I suppose, uh, not, not, not massively, you know, you, you, you go into it not knowing a lot, but um, we had been approached by um, just an endless parade of solar providers, um, I guess, like you were talking about. Um, just just earlier, and really difficult to get an idea of what is actually important to us um, in a supplier as a as a business um, ourselves. And uh, yeah, so you know you, you do get a little bit kind of um, wary of of the people going around um, trying to sell you something. But we had uh, we had just gone through. Uh, our energy market um, contracting negotiations with Choice, and I've been really happy with the service um, that Choice has provided, um, and that I guess that gave us the confidence that you guys were in it for the long haul, um, and uh, and it just seemed like a really good operation. Um, yeah, it gave us the it gave us the confidence to push ahead uh, with with installing solar uh, with Choice. Yeah, well, that's, that's really nice feedback. And I guess just on the flip side, what were some of the things you'd encourage other manufacturers to watch out for when you are being approached pretty aggressively by some of these companies? What were some of the red flags, I guess, of uh, what was coming at you pretty, pretty <sighs> thick and fast? <laughs> Look, the, the, I, there were definitely some of those, um, you'll, never get a, you'll never get an energy bill again kinds of things. Um, you do tend to uh, look, you know. I, I hope this isn't a, isn't isn't a prejudiced kind of thing, but you get some pretty slick operators coming by, and uh, you know, it's a, it, I I think it's it's it, it can be difficult to ch to tell um, who are, who's going to be the 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 better um, the better supplier, but uh, but I I, I got a, a good feeling of a, of an honest approach, I guess, from um, from choice, and some of the others were were were. Uh, more like a, a, a dog with a bone kind of a situation um, and really kind of, you know, I wasn't, I, I, I didn't feel like it was about what was in it for, 
for us as a business, but more uh, how I can how that person could um, could sign off that sale and move on to the next one. Yeah. Yeah, which is unfortunately uh, one of the sort of, I guess, mindsets that's out there and something definitely to be wary of. Um, and, and how did you find just the overall application process, installation process? Was there, ne- there any interruptions to your day-to-day business? Was it an easy process for you? Um, I, I, couldn't believe, I, I could not believe how, how painless it was, to be honest. Mm. Uh, I, had, I had expected it to be much more difficult at every stage, um, but... Uh, I guess you know from the from the contract negotiations um, through to uh, choice taking care of their end with the um, with the government incentives and and that sort of thing and then arranging the installers the installers themselves were really helpful um, you know even though we barely saw them I guess you know these people are, they're just they're working on your roof so you don't really see them yep. very much there was definitely uh, no interruption to business as usual for us um you know obviously you have a short shut down for that for that final connection but uh but you know we we scheduled that for the for the uh, early morning one day when we weren't operating very easy to to work around um and they yeah so they set that up uh, that was all really easy um and then setting up the monitoring software you know they put us onto that um and yeah, I mean, I've really had to, really had to think about the system since then. You know, you check in and see see the good that you've done um, once in a while, and uh, and you know, it's really nice to see that. Uh, but it's just it's sort of ticking away there, and we know that it's keeping the keeping the bills down and that sort of thing. So yeah, oh, that's fantastic. And I guess just a final question: Are there any other things that you're doing at the moment around sustainability practices or other initiatives that the, the business is looking at? Yeah, um, look, we, we're always trying to think of um, to, to think of, I guess, how we plan um, how we plan our, our business uh, growth with a with a thought to sustainability and carbon footprint. Um, so we're always trying to ensure that our processes are as energy efficient as possible. Um, so ensuring that we are not using any more gas or power than is absolutely necessary. So experimenting with how hot the water needs to be um, and how long we need to boil for and how efficient and um, how and how cold the the beer needs to be and for how long Um, those are sort of things that can that can help our 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 carbon footprint Um, and then doing things like uh, we're, we're definitely sourcing more of our more of our raw materials uh locally than we were um and that's you know i i uh, see that as a you know the, getting those food miles down we're also shifting uh transitioning away from plastic multi-packs uh to uh to cardboard wraps which are much more recyclable um mm-hmm. certainly in australia yeah oh that's that's really good to hear you know there's obviously lot, lots of different avenues you can come at it from so um thank you very much for sharing those insights and i think they'll be very valuable um to everyone online so um, appreciate that, Callum. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Um, so just uh, quickly, just to, to, to finalise the renewable discussion. So something that's very topical at the moment, especially with a lot of the climate zero um, uh, you know, activities that are happening at the moment, uh, is where are batteries at? With something we hear very, very regularly, uh, because solar and batteries can link up, obviously, to store some of the power that you are producing for times of day when you, you might not have the sun available to power your facility. Um, but in reality, for the type of uh, consumption that a typical food and beverage manufacturing company uh, would consume, they are years away from being viable. So uh, they unfortunately uh, don't have the, the capacity and are still extremely expensive. So when you're looking at paybacks, the estimates range anywhere from 12 to 20 years. Uh, payback on a battery system where the technology lifespan is something in the region of about 10 years. So to put that into context, I know there's been a couple of questions in the Q&A, a solar system will typically have a payback of around about the three to four year mark. So it's a much, much faster uh, payoff than it would be with a battery system. The other thing to be wary of is that battery prices and the technology really haven't been around that long. 
So solar technology has been around roughly 70 years. And over time, that cost of the technology has come down dramatically, but batteries are still relatively new on this sort of scale. So there's going to be significant downwards move movement in the cost of batteries over the next three to five years. So that everyone that we're speaking to at the moment, we're just saying, hold off if you do have a solar system already until we can kind of see the business case make a bit more sense. And just the final consideration there is if you are looking at a solar system, just make sure that it does have hybrid capability, which basically means that you can add a battery to the existing system when the timing does become right. So that you're not locked into having to replace that system if you do want to go down the batteries path in the future. And just the final little piece here, um, all of these acronyms and whatnot won't mean a lot to, to a lot of people. And that's why, as we talked about, a, a proper initial assessment to see what sort of funding you'll be eligible for from governments is very, very important because there are, for example, um, STC and LGC federal rebates, which come from a federal government program, as well as uh, other initiatives like the instant asset tax write-off, which expires in June 2023. Uh, all the way through to your local state and council solar rebates for states such as Victoria and Queensland. There's also some state manufacturing and R&D grants. So uh, as I mentioned, it's much, much easier to have a company, uh, for example, like Choice Energy that does this professionally to really help you know, identify where your business might be a good candidate for some of this funding. And you, you're not talking small dollars either. I mean, the maximum STC rebate at the moment is over $50,000. So it is a good time if you are considering to, to, to prompt an inquiry. And uh, at this point, I will hand back over to Alan, who's going to give us a little bit of an insight into the future energy market outlook. Thanks, Lockie, and thanks to Callum as well. That was a really good chat. And uh, Callum, uh, I did enjoy hearing your story. Um, that um, I did enjoy hearing your story that uh, it was our energy broking that got you over the line uh, for to trust us with your solar. Uh, so yeah, passionate about both sides of the business, but glad to know that they uh, they complement each other in real life. With it. Um, so this part is really having a look at the, the future of the energy and uh, what, what, what we always say here at Choice Energy is no one has a crystal ball. Um, you know, we know that in the trading market, there are traders that, that trade against energy and get it wrong a lot of the time. So no one knows for 100% sure, um, you know, exactly what the future is going to be. But we can see some trends and some past behaviours. And, and this is what we suspect. We, we think that um, the, looking at the in, uh, incentives to go for solar, uh, they will start to vastly reduce uh, come June 2023. Um, so as Lachlan mentioned, there's state and federal funding uh, towards renewable energy. Uh, but the big thing here is really uh, the tax write-off uh, that the ATO has allowed, um, at least in this interim period, uh, due to COVID reasons. So if you, uh, the best time to go solar was in 2011, 2012, the second best time to go solar is right now uh, with all of the, uh, the tax benefits of doing so. Uh, as discussed earlier, uh, we're looking at you know, generation and retailers increasing their pricing uh, to, to regain some of the losses that they've sustained throughout this period. And uh, what's been quite interesting about the uh, Glasgow climate talks is, um, you know, the pressure continued and, and probably amplified pressure that that's put on coal fired power stations, uh, not, not just around the world, but here in Australia. So the roadmap for their closure um, is by no means guaranteed. Uh, what we have seen is the financial viability of keeping a coal power, coal fired power station open, uh, tends it, it is trending downwards. Um, so um, the last thing we we see is uh, currently just over forty percent of businesses, uh, large users of electricity, use a, a broker. Um, and we see that trend uh, really picking up now. So we believe that 95% of large users uh, will soon work with an energy consultant uh, in the same way as they would do for tax. Okay, so uh, questions for the panel and thank you to everybody online. Uh, been having some great questions that have come through. Uh, first one here is uh, from David, which is in two parts, but it's juicy and I like it. Uh, David says, uh, given that this is a, a webinar focused on reducing energy costs and solar is great and it gives a, a good ROI. There are plenty more uh, technologies and processes uh, that have a, a potentially far greater ROI. Um, so would you 
uh, list the, the energy reduction opportunities and then sort, sort out the ones which give the highest ROI? I think that's a really good question, David. And uh, the very short answer would be yes. And um, that's exactly what we would do. Uh, we would go and get all of their interval data, build that load profile and figure out what's going to be the biggest uh, ba ba uh, bang for buck uh, that that customer can do first. And we would present a roadmap to them. Now, if they want to start with, uh, with broking as Callum did and then move to solar, um, then that's absolutely fine. And that's kind of the logical uh, sort of progression. Uh, but sometimes we do have customers that come to us and say, we just want solar. I'm glad that you can take care of the broking as well. So they want to start from different points, but absolutely uh, we, you have to sort of look under every stone to get, um, to, you know, drive some real efficiencies. So thank you for that robust question, Dave. I thought it was very good. Um, so Paul, uh, it's maybe one for you, Lachlan. I hear the cost of solar has come down a lot. Uh, but what's the typical payback period for businesses these days? So a lot of businesses can expect something in the region of about that three to four year payback range. And, and that's obviously very dependent on a number of factors. So there's no one size fits all in terms of what a solar payback will be. It is dependent on, for example, the amount of roof space available, what sort of network tariff that you're currently associated with, what's your cost of power, which can obviously vary a lot based on geography. So the more, I guess, remote areas of Australia typically have much higher power costs. So those ROIs are a lot shorter. Um, but then as, as Alan's been mentioning, you know, if the cost of power does increase, which we saw pretty dramatically about four years ago when the Hazelwood power station shut down in Victoria, and when the Northern Power Station shut down in South Australia, um, that obviously brings in that ROI even further. So, but three to four years is pretty typical. Awesome. Thank you, Lachlan. Uh, Callum, this is uh, uh, from Bodhi, who also runs a brewery. I don't know if you know him. It's quite a unique name. Uh, he installed solar six years ago on his uh, distillery. He wanted to, but he wants to add some more panels. Can he access further government funding to do this? Uh, Lock, what can he access for further government funding? Uh, certainly can, certainly can. So um, the government funding generally is worked out by the, the capacity of solar that you're looking to install. So if you increase that capacity, you will be um, you will be eligible for whatever subsidy uh, corresponds to that extra increase in solar power, even if you did it six years ago. So there's no limitation. The, the current funding arrangements from the federal government do expire in 2030. So it is a good time while that funding is still around if you are considering an upgrade or potentially have a second or third site to try and take some action there. Okay, and does roof orientation matter? Roof orientation does matter uh, considerably. Um, so the production or the performance of panels is heavily dependent on you know, how close to uh, the, the sun that they're going to be faced towards, you know, during certain times of day. So, you know, obviously the sun in the Southern Hemisphere, you know, starts in the East and comes across the, the Northern sky and then sets in the West. So for example, when we see systems that have a, a highly South facing uh, array, uh, those systems typically underperform anywhere from 30 to 40%. So again, you wanna make sure that the installer has actually put in, in some sort of writing that there will be a, a guarantee on your generation, or if it doesn't perform, that there'll be some sort of compensation there. And that's why, yeah, getting that roof orientation right at, from the start is, is very important. Thank you very much. A uh, question for you here, Callum. Uh, what was the time frame for signing off to go solar? And have you installed, uh, sorry, having installed your system and operating it fully? Uh, that is a good question because it was a few years ago when we installed um, at that at that factory. But it, I, it was certainly within a month. Um, I've uh, I've just I've just had um, solar installed at my at my house as well. This is the third <laughs> the third solar system we've installed with Choice, um, and that was probably that was probably uh, done within within three weeks or so. Um, but yeah, being being a couple of years later, I suppose um, I suppose you guys would would have a better idea of what that what that time frame is. Yeah, I think that depends. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, Lachlan. Uh, thanks for your insight there, Callum. I think that it depends on what time of year uh, you buy solar. 
um, because uh, the the um, some of the funding ends at the end of the calendar year, um, and so uh, to to get the funding you have to have a, a system that's fully installed and signed off by the regulator. Uh, so we tend to see a bit of a rush towards December, which you know of course is getting sunny as well. So people are thinking about solar, um, but yeah, I, I think your lead times are probably indicative of of, uh, of where we are today. So I'm glad we were there back then as well, Callum, and uh, congrats on, uh, on on getting solar for your house and. Uh, just bought my, one my uh, new house myself, so I'm just getting solar put on. Makes you feel very good as a as a homeowner. Uh, we're doing your bit. Um, awesome, very thank you very much. Okay, so uh, once I've I've installed solar, how do I know if it's functioning correctly? I hear a lot of people have no idea, Lockman. Yeah, so as Callum alluded to before, um, a, an installation should, or this is our belief, and this is not necessarily held by the industry, but it should come with some form of monitoring or ability to assess the system's uh, performance in real time. So uh, typically you can install or you can set up a Wi-Fi compatible monitoring system uh, that will come with a brand of inverter. And then that just allows you to have on any smart device like your mobile phone or your computer access to the system's performance. And then if your installer uh, is engaged with you post installation and you have any questions, you should feel comfortable to ring them up and say, hey, what does this data mean? A am I producing what I should? Um, so that would be the easiest way. And that you know, is a pretty inexpensive way of continuing to, to check on your system's performance. But unfortunately, there are a lot of systems around Australia which don't have um, any sort of monitoring uh, uh, set up. So in that scenario, I would, I would encourage people to ring their installer and, and try and get some answers as to what the system's doing. Awesome, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've used comparison sites to reduce my energy bills before. Uh, what can I expect if you use an energy broker instead? Uh, are there further ways to uh, reduce my energy costs? Um, so uh, in a nutshell, uh, a broker will take a more detailed view of your business when taking it to uh, providers. So uh, an energy comparison uh, site, often you can sort of switch your insurance, switch your energy, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, they're, they're going out for sort of standard rates that they have available. Um, so you're very unlikely to get as good a deal uh, through a comparator as you would uh, through a broker. Um, when broking your energy for your home, uh, or if you're on mass market as well, typically uh, brokers wouldn't charge anything for that. And they would uh, be transparent about the companies they've gone to and uh, not have a, a sort of a preferred uh, supplier or anything like that. So um, yeah, broker is going to be a far more sort of transparent and like Callum used the word honest, uh, that's, that's uh, probably what a broker will give you, give you the insight to how it's all done. Um, so I spend about $600, $700 per month on electricity. Is it worth considering solar, Lockie? That would certainly yeah, fall into the range where solar can have uh, a reasonable effect on your, on your power bills, obviously. And for a lot of businesses, $10,000 a year, you know, it's still a considerable cost and over say a five year or 10 year period, that's, you know, over 10 years, that's $100,000 assuming power prices don't go up. So having a solar solution, which is offsetting, you know, potentially 40 or 50% of that usage over time would still certainly make sense at that, that price point. Okay, excellent. Um, and Callum, uh, this may be a last one actually, but Callum, uh, do you promote your environmental credentials alongside your products? It's not a key part of our um, of our marketing. I know it is for a lot of people, um, and it's. I guess it's just uh, you know in in terms of how we uh, how we kind of arrange our marketing plans. It's it's not something that we have that we have pushed. Um, and I but I think now is kind of uh, the time where it is going to be it is going to um, become more. Uh, more important to our uh, to our market to our promotional mix to um, to be talking about those environmental credentials. Um, yeah, I, I, I've certainly seen a lot of people do that, um, and and with with some success, um, and uh, something that we're extremely proud of. But uh, but yeah, we don't we we haven't really pushed it uh, pushed it that much. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting to, uh, to to hear that. Uh, you've obviously got uh, some pretty cool branding. Uh, my uh, uh, very, very noticeable and, and distinct. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, requirement from uh, supply chains to be uh, reporting on carbon. So obviously you guys are doing the, the right thing and have been for a long time anyway. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely see that that conversation uh, almost as much as batteries really uh, about having that strategy and where are you on the journey to being, you know, 
and in your carbon process um so yeah that's very I think, cool uh, thank- could i just could i just add to that it's very very difficult for a brewery to to really promote um it's uh it's carbon <laughs> carbon footprint because it's almost impossible to produce beer without without the use of gas so um i, I don't like to leave myself open in that in that regard yeah so yeah yeah it's definitely a pressure i think it, it's uh, the only way you can't not you can't make beer without using carbon. Uh, I think the way that uh, companies will uh, move towards is buying green power, uh, so the power they're using to make it, and then also offsetting sort of any residual carbon footprint uh, as much as they can. Um, but uh, yeah, congratulations to you and your business, and uh, great to see you're doing very well, and uh, in yeah, it's still still in a great uh, a great market. There's a very big need for your product, and. Uh, I enjoy, I'm from the southwest of England, so I enjoy your Golden Axe uh, cider. I can definitely plug that. Um, so thanks very much for joining us, uh, Callum. I want to say uh, thanks to everyone uh, attending online and Lachlan as well for your insights. Uh, very much appreciated. Margaret, thank you for hosting us. Uh, it's been some pretty robust questions at the end, uh, which uh, is normally a good sign that these things have gone well and the uh, you know, passions are evoked and that's certainly how we feel about it. Um, we'll be distributing the video to everybody who has attended with links if you did want to share that with colleagues or business partners as well. Um, and we'll be offering free energy reviews for all the attendees to see if we can save some money for your business. Uh, so we wish you all the best and thank you very much to everyone for attending.